My great grandmother, Sadie Tanner Marcel, was born in 1898 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, into a highly accomplished African American family. Her maternal grandfather, Benjamin Tanner, was Bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he and his wife, Sarah Elizabeth Tanner, had seven children, including the renowned painter Henry Oswa Tanner and Mary Louise Tanner Marcel, Sadie's mother. Her father was Aaron Marcel Jr the first Black person to graduate from the law school at the University of Pennsylvania. However, he left his wife and three children when Sadie were just a year old. Her mother later moved the family to Washington, D.C. to live near her sister and brother-in-law, Louis Baxter Moore, a professor at Howard University. Young Sadie's family alternated between living in D.C. and living in Philadelphia. During high school, she lived in Washington, D.C. and attended the all-Black, well-regarded, M Street High School, where she graduated in 1915. After high school, she moved back to Philadelphia at her mother's insistence to attend the University of Pennsylvania. While there, she experienced racial isolation from white classmates and discriminatory treatment. Her isolation lessened when she became close friends with fellow student Virginia Alexander and her brother Raymond Pace Alexander while he was an undergraduate student at the Wharton School of Finance and Commerce. In 1918, my great-grandmother Sadie received a Bachelor of Science degree in education. The following year, in 1919, Sadie Mussel obtained a master's degree in economics, also from Penn. She also became the first national president of Delta Sigma Theta sorority after having been a charter member of the Gamma chapter at University of Pennsylvania. In the fall of 1919, she began doctoral studies at Penn and received a university scholarship in economics. With the recommendation of her economics professors, she later received the highly competitive Francis Sargent Pepper Fellowship. Sadie Massell wrote her dissertation, The Standard of Living Among 100 Negro Migrant Families in Philadelphia, in response to the early Great Migration of African Americans from the South to the North. The Great Migration was one of the largest voluntary internal migrations in U.S. history. 10% of the 400,000 Black people who left the South beginning in 1916 in response to increased demand for workers during World War I relocated to Philadelphia. Migrants hoped to build better lives for themselves and their children and wanted rights and freedoms they lacked in the South. Voting rights, educational and job opportunities, higher wages, and justice in the courts of law. They also fled from Southern racial terror. However, the large and sudden increase in Philadelphia's Black population amplified racial tensions. White mob violence against African Americans in Philadelphia escalated into four days of mayhem in July 1918, as African Americans defended themselves against white attacks. By July 30th, city police had arrested some 60 Black residents, even though whites were the main instigators of the deadly clash. The Philadelphia attacks preceded the reign of racial terror that white Americans waged against African Americans throughout the nation in the red summer of 1919 in order to maintain white supremacy. Two weeks before my great-grandmother earned a doctoral degree, white residents of Tulsa, Oklahoma burned down the most prosperous African-American community in the country, the Greenwood District, by destroying 35 city blocks, an event that led to hundreds of African-American deaths and displacement of some 10,000 African-American residents. Well, I uh, finished Penn undergraduate school in three years. I was propelled to do this because my grandfather was approaching 90, and I was dependent upon him for my tuition. Now, in June of 1921, I received the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Economics. It was a great occasion because I was the first black woman in the United States to qualify and to receive the degree. And I can well remember marching down Broad Street from Mercantile Hall to the Academy of Music when 
there were photographers from all over the world taking my picture. It was, all of the glory of, of that occasion faded, however, quickly when I tried to get a position. On June 15, 1921, Sadie Moselle became the first African American to earn a doctorate degree in economics and one of the three African American women who that year became the first in US history to receive a doctorate in any field. Sadie Moselle's accomplishment received media coverage throughout the nation. However, because of racial and gender discrimination, she did not receive job offers anywhere in the North that were commensurate with her degree. She took a job as an assistant actuary with the largest black insurance company in the United States, North Carolina Mutual Life in Durham, North Carolina. After two years in 1923, she left her position and returned to Philadelphia to marry Raymond Pace Alexander, who had just graduated from Harvard Law School. Facing continued job discrimination in Philadelphia, Sadie Alexander decided to attend law school at the University of Pennsylvania because she viewed the law as a means for advancing opportunities for African Americans. In 1927, she became the first Black woman to graduate from the law school and to pass the bar exam in Pennsylvania. She worked as an attorney at the law firm that Raymond Alexander established. Both of my great-grandparents, Sadie and Raymond Alexander, were early principal members of the National Bar Association, and their law firm was instrumental in drafting legislation that outlawed racial segregation in Pennsylvania. In the mid-1930s, Sadie and Raymond Alexander welcomed two lovely daughters, Mary Elizabeth and Ray Pace, to their family. This period also coincided with Sadie Alexander's increased involvement in professional and civic associations and increased demand as a public speaker. Her speeches focused on systemic barriers that prevented African Americans from having full access to the democratic and economic rights of citizenship, while also calling for social action and policy changes to dismantle the barriers. Importantly, she continued to practice economics in the public realm. Discrimination that she faced as a black woman could not take away her hard won doctoral degree in economics and all of the knowledge that represented. And now we commemorate the 100 year anniversary of the day when Sadie Tanner Marcel Alexander received her doctoral degree in economics with the recovery of her intellectual thought through the publication of her speeches and writings on the economic status of African Americans. Her speeches are a testament to her tremendous intellectual acumen and her lifelong pursuit of racial justice. The speeches remain relevant to our political economy since they speak to our current moment of national reckoning with racial injustice. With their publication, Sadie T.M. Alexander finally takes her place among our nation's major intellectuals and great economists. I'd like to thank you all for coming to this wonderful occasion, the book launch for the newly published book, Democracy, Race and Justice, The Speeches and Writing of Sadie T.M. Alexander. Uh, this is a celebration of the new book, but it is also time to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the day that uh, Sadie Alexander received her doctoral degree, becoming the first African American to graduate with that degree in the field of economics. Uh, I have to thank Nina Banks, not only for the book, but for working with Wes Bernstein to produce that video that we were able to see just now. 
that reviewed the early life and career of Sadie Alexander. Uh, we also have another welcome video that will be posted on the website of the National Economics Association. And I hope that you'll turn to that within the next few days. Today, we have a host of speakers. Uh, we are fortunate to have members of the family of Sadie uh, Alexander, as well as other um, key individuals who helped to produce this uh, wonderful book. Our brief meeting will be moderated by Rhonda Sharp, who I think many of you know is the founding and current president of the Women's Institute for Science, Equity, and Race. Uh, Dr. Sharp has a long career in academia, and rather than list all the uh, universities where she has taught, I will mention that she was the chair of the economics department at Bennett College, and that she's actually known as the magnificent mentor for all the work she has done in inspiring and guiding students towards achievement in economics. Um, I'm Moline Johnson, formerly a vice president at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and a senior advisor at the Federal Reserve Board. Um, and I also served as the United States Executive Director at the African Development Bank. Both Dr. Sharp and I, and I should also mention, uh, we are past presidents of the National Economics Association and Professor Nina Banks is our current president. So we're very proud of um, Professor Banks at this time. We are also pleased to have the presidents of three of our academic associations, learned, uh, learned societies and other individuals who played a key role in the production of the book. And the first of those individuals to speak to us today is Professor Radhika Balakrishnan, who is the current president of the International Association for Feminist Economists. Dr. Balakrishnan is the faculty director of the Center for Women's Global Leadership and professor of women's and gender studies at Rutgers University. Dr. Balakrishnan, please tell us about the ongoing work that feminist economists are doing to recover the economic thought of early women economists. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say I'm very honored to be here for the launch of this really important book, Democracy, Race and Justice, The Speeches and Writings of Sadie T.M. Alexander. To me, this entire project is to bring light to, to early feminist economics research by Sadie, Dr. Uh, Alexander, but it's also a project where feminist economists are writing feminist economic history because so much of our history is written by people who are not in the field. So if there wasn't a feminist economist like Nina Banks recovering this history, this is to me a really important feminist economic project. And Dr. Banks's research on this book was inspired by other feminist economists who are also here. So I think Julian Malvo and her early uh, work inspired Dr. Banks to uh, do this research. And also Dr. Malvo started her own research at the urging of Phyllis Wallace, her mentor. And so it's really a history of feminist economics and feminist economists recovering our own history. And so I think it's important to, to, to say that. I'm gonna read a little bit from, from uh, the introduction of the book. When Alexander obtained her doctorate degree in economics in 1921, 100 years ago, she became a small group of women economists in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. White women were very active in the economic profession and made a substantial contribution. And as the documentary said, 
it wasn't true for, for uh, Dr. Alexander to be able to find a position in economics. Uh, there were uh, books and uh, articles published, but her work really is brought to light. And having read the introduction of the book, she really was a pioneer in looking at feminist economic issues like paid work and unpaid care work, what that happens to, to labor. And so we're covering that history is really critical. A lot of the history of economics is written not by feminist economists and especially feminist economists of color. We're covering other uh, feminist economists of, of, of color and especially African-Americans. And so one of this is an omission of our own history. And so to me, this book is such an important book to bring out these ideas. And, and for me in particular, the relationship between her work as an economist and her work as an activist in bringing about democracy and justice is really critical because not, that doesn't happen that often. And, and my own work doing human rights work, I was very excited to look at the ways she's going, I'm going to buy the book today and look at the ways in which the civil rights movement and economic policy were put together. So I'm hoping to learn quite a bit. Uh, so the, to me, uh, it's such an important uh, thing that Dr. Banks has, has done by bringing this, this literature out. And I think it will help rewrite who feminist economists were from a very early time. And I cannot wait to read the whole book. Thank you very much. We are now honored to introduce Dr. Julianne Malvo. Um, in reading the book of Sadie Alexander, I couldn't help think that she was in many ways a public intellectual. And many of us think of Dr. Malvo as being a person who brings issues of economics to the fore for all the people to act on, to understand, and to consider and extend our own understanding. Uh, again, if I were to list all of her achievements, I would take up all her time. Uh, let me simply say that, uh, that Dr. Malvo was the president of Bennett College and is about to embark on an, an innovative adventure in learning by being the founding head of the College of Ethnic Studies at uh, California State University in Los Angeles. Um, oh, Dr. Malvo actually was the one who brought, shine the light for most of us on the work of, of Sadie Alexander. And I'd like to ask her to make a few comments about how she came to that discovery and why she thinks that it was important for the world to, to know about Sadie Alexander and her work. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aline. And um, of course, uh, gosh, Nina, just so proud of you for taking this project to the end and a hundred years after Sadie received her degree. And of course, thank you, Rhonda Sharp, for your innovative leadership around uh, disaggregating data, <laughs> which, is, which is your thing, and we, we appreciate it. I've been trying to figure out for the past um, couple of weeks when, how I got to Sadie. I know that Dr. Phyllis Ann Wallace, who was my mentor, my sister friend, um, I called her my economics mom, mentioned her. But I think that you know, those of you who know me know I have a very contrary streak. And so I believe having a conversation with one of my brother economists about participating in something at the NEA about Black economic history. And they mentioned a bunch of names and I said, well, what about the women? And he very dismissively, of course, he did get uh, told about himself. He very dismissively, well, I don't think, I can't think of any women economists who made a significant contribution. So I went whining to Phyllis, uh, Dr. Wallace, and said, you know, well, I can't tell you everything I said because she had to calm me down. She said, well, let's just go look at Sadie Alexander. And so that started me on the path. And um, of course, I did the piece for the AEA uh, journal. But what's also interesting is that I got to know Ray. I don't know if she's on the call now, but she's just become such a delight and a friend. And um, 
One of the things that Ray said to me really motivated the title of my piece in the AEA. She said, I mean, we're all very frustrated about the way, many ways that Sadie was unable to fully function as an economist. She wasn't able to get an academic job, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I was venting with Ray and Ray said, don't ever write anything that makes anyone feel sorry for my mother. She didn't miss out. America missed out. And that's how I see it. So the title of the piece was Missed Opportunities. Uh, and then the subtitle, of course, about Sadie Alexander. But she was a missed opportunity. Uh, by our sister from IAFI, uh, she put it out there very well. Um, in terms of the fact that we are not writing about us, history belongs to she who holds the pen. And so Nina has been holding the pen for a Black woman economist with this piece. But all too often our histories are swallowed because it does not serve some people to know the whole truth. It does not serve some people to know that we've been doing it as long as they've been doing it. And what breaks my heart when I think about Sadie, not to make anybody feel sorry for her, as Ray said, but one of the anecdotes she had where she, on a rainy day, is looking for her classroom. And she asks a white student, where is this classroom? And the woman just walked by her without speaking. She didn't answer her. Sadie said in her, I believe it was her journal, and Nina will correct me if I'm wrong. She said, imagine my surprise when I finally found the classroom and this girl was sitting in the front row. So just deliberate shunning. She had to be very, very lonely. But you know, that loneliness, she said, and what she said in that particular journal entry, I am so lonely, I have no one but God. But you know what? That's a good thing, because God will see you through. And that's literally, she was a religious woman, uh, she was a, a civic leader. Uh, she had a board position with the National Urban League. Um, in fact, I always tell people that the Urban League State of Black America might have been written, the first one, 20 to 40 years earlier, had Sadie been allowed to work to her potential. But she wasn't. She still did a lot. She still did an awful lot, but I also often think of her frustration. Imagine a airline pilot being told the best he could do was check out groceries at the store. Well, that's the same thing you're telling a PhD economist when you tell her that she gets to be an actuary. But she couldn't find another gig. And that's why she moved on. And so part of what I always tell people about Sadie when I'm talking to young people is she is an example of have a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Always have a backup plan. She had a backup plan. She wanted to do econ. She was great at econ, but she was also a great lawyer. She was also just a great person and thinker and mentor. And so Dr. Wallace, who was all of that to me, Dr. Wallace and I were a funny combination. She was very prim and proper. And as y'all can tell, I ain't. I mean, I have been a college president. I'm going to be a dean. But basically, I'm um, when I went to see my mom for one of the last times, I walked into the room and said, yo, mom, it's your problem, child. And uh, I was able to get a smile out of her. <laughs> For that one. But uh, Dr. Wallace was prim and proper and I'm not, but we got along famously because we got each other. And what we got each other about was the whole issue of social and economic justice. And, and, and that's what we also got, that's what we talked about Sadie so much is the whole issue of justice and how, see black academics until recently have not had the luxury of the ivory tower. W. E. Du Bois didn't have it, Sadie didn't have it, they had to be involved in social policy. They couldn't just say, oh, I'm gonna study this over here. No, they had to help implement it. And that's what they did. Willie knows I can go on and on, but I'm not gonna, cause there are a lot of other great speakers. I, again, just, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. This is making me smile just to think about Sadie and this book. Nina, I can't read, wait to read it. And I'll be writing about it as well so that other people know about it. Keep up the great work and sisters, thank you for allowing me to join you. Thank you so much, Julianne. And now I'd like to turn to Nina, who is the certainly the author of the day, but who has long worked to really fill in the gaps in our history of economic thought. Um, Nina, or better, more properly said, Professor Banks, please uh, tell us some about what inspired you to continue this work, 
to extend the work that Julianne Malvo started on Sadie Alexander. Thanks, Willene, and thanks, Julianne. Um, you know, for those of you who have the book, you'll notice that the very first sentences are about missed opportunity. Julianne's um, really foundational article on the loss, the implications of the loss of Sadie Alexander's intellectual thought to the development of the economics profession. So I was motivated um, and inspired by a number of sources, one of which was Sadie Alexander's 1930 article that she published in Opportunity Magazine, Negro Women in Our Economic Life, which really anticipated many of the arguments that later generations of feminist economists made about the transformation of women's household work as a result of the marketization of that work when it was taken from the household um, and into the, the, the capitalist economy. That was one source. Um, I read that in the late 1990s and just was really struck by it. Um, feminist economists, as, as Radhika said, were doing this really important work to uncover the the thought of early women economists that had been lost to our profession or too often attributed to men. And so when I read Julianne's Missed Opportunity article, and I read that probably around 2002 or so, that really motivated me to go to the archives at the University of Pennsylvania, where Sadie Alexander's records are stored, to find out if if she said anything about economics. And so I think that it's important to remember back you know, a long time ago, 2003, when I started this research, um, two important things that I think have been lost since then, right? One is that back in 2003, um, economists thought that George Edmund Haynes was the first African-American economist. And that's because there was a publication that came out or, or a paper in 1990 by an economist that said that George Edmund Haynes was the first African-American economist. And so that's what we thought. That's what Julianne thought and what I thought when we started our research on Sadie Alexander. And then the other thing to note, um, to remember back in 2003, is that no one, no one thought that Sadie Alexander had continued to really think about economic issues and to focus on economic problems after she became a lawyer. And so when I went into the archives again, 2003, um, I was really shocked to read through some of her correspondence and note that they included, the correspondence included economic analysis. Um, and, and that was certainly the case whenever I read through her speeches. Um, I faced a lot of challenges over this almost two decades period of trying to um, recover the economic thought, the intellectual thought of Sadie Alexander. Enormous challenges. And one of the challenges that I faced um, was the condition of the speeches. The speeches were not in very good condition generally. Some of them were, but many of them were not. Sadie Alexander's early speeches from the 1920s were handwritten. The later speeches were typed, but they had handwritten notes inserted. Um, all of her speeches had cross outs and arrows. Um, and so um, recovering Sadie Alexander's economic thought was very labor intensive, and it really involved a process of reconstructing her speeches. My research assistant, Lily Shorney, was, was um, remarkable in helping to reconstruct those, those speeches, especially the early speeches that were, that were handwritten. Um, so when I reflect back on over this long period of time that it took to to recover her intellectual thought, I actually think that the speeches, the publication of the speeches today, 2021 on the 100th anniversary um, is better than if I had published the speeches in 2010 or 2015, because those speeches will really resonate with readers today in a way in which they would not have resonated in an earlier period. Because the speeches that cover, again, a 40 year, 50 year period, really speak to issues that, are we, that we are 
um, talking about extensively as a country today. Um, the centrality of racial oppression in our history and the necessity of teaching that history. The importance of full employment job guarantees and the persistence of, of discrimination, employment discrimination against black workers. The need for investments in social infrastructure. The rise of fascism and practices that undermine the rule of law over-policing and unwarranted searches and seizures, disinvestments in black communities, protest against racial injustice, and so on and so on. Um, and so early on, I set out to restore the economic thought of Sadie Alexander to the discipline of economics. But as I continued to go through, to work my way through this huge archival record of over 81 boxes of, of files, of records, um, what I realized is that Sadie Alexander was important not only to the economics profession, but also to African American history and therefore the history of our nation in general. And so I'm going to stop right there. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to pass the baton to Rhonda, Dr. Rhonda Sharp, uh, who will continue the program. Thank you, Elaine, and um, thank you, Nina, so much for this 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 wonderful work. Right, so excited, super excited to be here. Um, I want to take an opportunity to have the family join us. So let's see, Mrs. Kennedy. Um, Dr. Brown, Raymond Brown, and I do believe uh, Dr. Ray Alexander Mentor will join us a little bit later. No? No, okay. And I believe we're expecting um, the granddaughter, Nicole, who I saw pop in and, and will we'll come, come back. So um, as soon as is Raymond and Mrs. Kennedy can get you to join us, please. I unmuted. <laughs> okay, and we and we we just need you to turn your camera on for us, Mrs. Candidate. Um, I Perfect. Don't... There we go. Okay, so so let me let me start by saying thank you so much for um, donating your mother's and your grandmother's materials to the archive, which allowed, which gave both access to Nina and Julianne so that we can have this book and learn more about her. Now, having said that, can you tell us a little bit about what motivated your thoughts about donating your mother's work to the archives? Well, I got a telephone call from Nina and this is the first time I've had a chance to uh, see her. And uh, we must have talked for over an hour. Of course, I would not have said no anyway. And um, it was my conversation with Nina that uh, allowed, um, I, I shouldn't say allowed, but that gave impetus for uh, this wonderful development, okay? And um, I'm calling her Nina, but uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Banks, I feel like I've really gained you as another member of the family because we've had wonderful telephone conversations. And your work has unearthed a lot about my mother for all to see and to understand. Now, she was uh, not simplistic at all. So <laughs> let's hope that she, at least her brilliance, uh, will now be uh, noticed in economics and uh, understood. And she also, this opportunity, uh, Nina, allowed people to see how economics was joined in uh, her then future, uh, uh, her legal work. Uh, she's no longer now a scholar who's been denied and you placed her in the field of economics forever. Your courage to initiate the exploration of my mother's papers, and it was an untiring effort, I'm sure, to return to the Penn archives where I went a couple of times just to look through some of the scrapbooks that they had on both my parents. And for me, it was really uh, overwhelming, it, it really was. 
my mother would be very proud of you for your diligence. Uh, she was quite something about diligence. She would um, sit with me when I was in high school and took Latin and I was okay just doing the con what do you call the conjugations, eh, up to B plus work maybe, but no, 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 no. I do remember, I think I got one A in vocabulary. And that was when she, my mother sat with me and made me repeat and repeat and repeat. She was extremely diligent, no doubt. So you've been able to un, uh, usurp all of this uh, for her. And we're very, very proud of you and your hard work. So I want to end this with a little story that I remember about my mother. Actually, these were things she taught us. Work hard, save your money. <laughs> Don't run out and spend it all. You can reward yourself with quote, a little something. Don't go out and spend it all. And to those three points, I want to add a fourth one that I heard my daughter, Virginia say, which I think is very important. And it is something uh, that I think is a legacy of my mother, her grandmother. Each one, reach one and teach one. Okay, that would be what she would want future scholars to do. And Dr. Banks and Nina, once again, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Candidate. So I see we have been joined by um, another daughter, Dr. Ray Alexander Mentor. And so the question I posed was, well, I posed the question on, and that was what motivated your family to donate uh, your mother's works to the archives, but listening to what your your sister just said, Mrs. Canada just said, I'd love to just hear your thoughts and your comments about your mom and maybe your favorite memory of her, and 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 then if you would like to share why it was important to donate her works to the archives, that would be great. Wow. I'm not Dr. Kidding. Alexander. What happened? I'm not she needs to sure. unmute. Okay, so, so while we're waiting for her to unmute, um, from the grandchildren, Virginia or Raymond, um, do you, I, Virginia, I saw that you put, you put in the quote, listening to your grandmother's voice in the video, just, brought back memories. Would either one of you like to, to share um, a memory as well as why it's important for you to have your grandmother's works in the archives? Well, my brother and I have been um, back channeling the entire time swapping stories. And I think there's two things I'd like to say. Hearing my grandmother's voice, it's been, Lord, more than 35 years. Mm -hmm. um, more than probably about 30 to 35 years. My grandmother um, had Alzheimer's and it had the impact of taking her voice, which was one of the most cruel things that can happen when people live with Alzheimer's to have taken her voice. So for Nina to have put her words back in action and to have heard her today was particularly inspiring. And I think, you know, people always ask, you know, what, what was it like to be a part of this family? And yeah, it was different, but it was very much the same. It was when we came east, <clears throat> we grew up mostly in California till we moved east. You know, dinners at my grandparents' house, stories of history, the demand to pay attention. My brother was a better historian than I was. I always wanted to go out and play. Um, and just the idea that diligence and hard work and being good at your craft was something that was critically important. And I think my, my brother and certainly my, my, my daughter can attest to that by example. 
you you work hard. Um, you don't always get what you want, but you feel good that you did your best. So I'll close with that thought. Thank you. Thank you. And Raymond? Uh, yeah, you've been trying to get to the root of these papers at Penn. And <laughs> I, 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 I would say that my grandparents obviously had a comprehension of their, their uh, significance. And um, there were two things that they did with Penn and they had a, obviously a, a strong and, and, and a deep relationship with Penn. And so they, they left their papers to the university. And they also started the endowment for a chair in their name at the law school. And uh, Representative Evans from Pennsylvania was instrumental in uh, procuring money from the state to fulfill that. And, and so, you know, I, I say that as far as my grandparents knew that their work was significant and Penn was the place to house it. And they left that legacy as far as the papers and, and the beginning of their endowment. And that chair is fulfilled now. And I think these two are, are great foundations for further work and recognition of, of, of the work that they started. So, uh, you know, they, they wanted to preserve what they did and, and have others be able to build upon it. And, and you know, that's, that's another important thing to remember is, is that, you know, people speak of where they would have been if they were born a few years later. Well, um, you know, that's not the case, but they certainly did build roads and paths for the work of uh, other subsequent people. I mean, you, you look at um, my grandfather's first judge of Pennsylvania. Um, you know, he, he might have been a federal judge. It was later, but subsequently, uh, I forgot the gentleman's name, but there was one uh, in his lifetime. And Thurgood Marshall, of course, on the Supreme Court. And all those achievements had to happen or only could happen if someone started the work, the journey before them. So, you know, the people that followed are, are people that built on what they had done. Thank you. And, and, and you lived right up to what your sister said in terms of being more of the historian. So, so thank you so much for, for sharing that. And so, Nicole. Uh, I'll, I'll share one, one small anecdote. Our, okay. our family's full of firsts. And uh, my significant first is, actually insignificant though, but I was the first black teacher at Episcopal High School and I taught history there. It's a, a, a Southern boarding school in Alexandria, Virginia. But uh, I, I clearly remember when I was approached for this job, uh, knowing my, my grandparents' history uh, was motivation for me to accept that challenge. And so, uh, you know, it, it varied with me definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So Nicole, want to thank you for the lovely narration that we heard at the beginning of the webinar um, and, and ask you similarly, um, what does having your grandmother's papers in the archive mean for you? And if you'll tell us just a little bit about what it was like for you to go through and narrate your grandmother's story. Thank you. And first, a big congratulations to you, Dr. Banks, on this accomplishment. It's um, extraordinarily exciting. I messaged her um, in the process of recording the narration to say that I, I was floored um, all over again to read my family history collected in one place to kind of see all the threads and connections and all the people who were working you know, for themselves and on behalf of other Black people at the time. Um, it's really, I mean, I think that it, I'm in awe. There's no other way to describe it. Um, it's kind of incredible when you take into consideration the history um, and the time period in which they were laboring. I'd say the biggest thing, maybe the biggest lesson or something that I've taken away from just hearing my grandmother's legacy and coming to understand it in new ways as I've gotten older, um, is that, you know, she was working in many ways on behalf of, you know, the quote unquote, the race. Um, she was thinking about her own situation in life and the, the um, opportunities that she had access to and didn't have access to, and her story and all of those barriers that existed um, are barriers for all of the people who you know look like her or are part of that community. And I think in our family, it has been always very clear that um, we are all or there's a connection, um, and that we are always our work is sort of. Um, 
always engaged with that idea that <laughs> we can't sort of say, can't be separated uh, when the law is written this way. And so I think having her work in the archives is incredibly important to kind of expose and, and show the inner workings, the internal struggles, the commitment, the, you know, the letters, the connections, the relationships, it sort of just provides more context and opportunity for people to kind of get a better picture of, of what it meant to her and, and the challenges that she faced um, that are both personal and political. Um, so that's, that's sort of my big takeaway. And, and I find that I continue that spirit, I'd say, into my own work as an investigative journalist, um, thinking about the prison system. And I see those threads still today. Um, so yeah, so it's just been you know, a wonderful occasion to get to re-examine and um, look at it you know, a different way and, and share it with the public. So, so thank you, and I'm, I'm really happy to hear you say the connection between the personal and the political, because it is uh, one of the things that I wrote. Uh, I had the pleasure of being one of the reviewers for the book, and, and it's literally what I say in my quote, and that is that Sadie Alexander embodies the Black feminist saying, the political is personal. Her speeches brilliantly intertwine economics and law, and I think will empower the next generation of scholar activists fighting for social justice, coming back thinking about what um, Julianne Malveaux said earlier, that in, in her time, your great grandmother's time and your great grandfather's time, how uh, uh, Black scholars, PhDs, didn't have the luxury just to kind of sit back and do research, but they also had to be activists. So, so thank you for, for bringing that point. And thank you, family, for allowing us access both to hear your voices today to have and to have access to your mother's work. We, we are very grateful. One of the things that I think we often forget, and that is in the, as, as people are doing work, it's not just your research, but you also have to have the person who is at a publishing company who has the foresight to actually think about um, or recognize the contribution of a book. And so um, Seth Ditchick, who is the editor of the book at Yale University Press. Now, my question to you, Seth, is what was it about the work that Nina was doing to recover Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander's work that made you say, we, we have to be the press to publish this edited volume of speeches. Thanks, hi. Um, I'm Seth Ditchick, the editorial director at Yale Press. I've also been publishing books uh, in economics for 20 years. Um, Yale is incredibly proud to be the publisher of this. I wanna give credit where it's due on this book. Uh, the, actually the editor who, uh, who initiated the book for the press uh, was a colleague of mine named Taiba Batul who reached out to Nina um, having heard her speak on a podcast uh, uh, about the work uh, of Sadie Alexander and so I want to uh, uh, I want to credit her with uh, the uh, for, for reaching out and when uh, uh, Taiba left the press I was really uh, thrilled to be able to take this uh, from that point to publication. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's really important here is that I think publishers have an opportunity and a responsibility to provide a platform for overlooked and marginalized voices. And I think that perhaps nowhere is the service more needed or urgent than in economics, uh, where those voices often fall by the wayside as they run through gauntlets of gatekeepers. And I think where books have a critical role to play in facilitating a conversation that doesn't always happen in journal articles. Um, I think also, uh, um, you know, publishing uh, uh, Sadie Alexander's work and, and Dr. Banks's labor in uncovering and in situating this work, I think are really first steps towards correcting a blind spot, both in economics, also really in publishing, uh, both of which are grappling with the historical challenges that we've had recognizing and elevating diverse voices. Um, Dr. Malfo mentioned that uh, history belongs to she who holds the pen earlier in this uh, uh, talk. And, and I think it was a critical failure that we didn't take this, we didn't have the opportunity, we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't find a way to take this history from her pen to the world up until now. Um, 
And so, you know, but Yale is really honored to play a part in fixing uh, this mistake. I think also um, the book really shows the enduring value of books, uh, you know, at a time when we've come to think that everything is available online and we know, you know, kind of all information is, is right there. Uh, uh, Dr. Banks's work, uh, um, you know, in taking something that had been in archives and in, in uh, you know, in filling in the, the, the gaps and in, um, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, bringing this out of the archives into the world, I think is really a, a reaffirmation of why books still matter. Um, so, you know, for all those reasons, you know, I think it, it's just, it, it's really, it's been wonderful to be involved in this. Uh, also, I'll mention that, um, uh, uh, that, that uh, Professor Banks is, is actually working on a biography. Uh, it's a work in progress, but a, but a biography of, uh, of, of Sadie Alexander's uh, life. Um, so that will be, uh, you know, at some point uh, in the future, that will be an opportunity to, um, uh, uh, to really kind of, again, broaden um, the information uh, and, and the audience uh, for this work. Thank you, Seth, and thank you for, for doing that early plug of the biography and to the audience and to the family. I want to note that um, I mispronounced her name. It is Marcel is the way that you, you pronounce that. And so that's going to bring us to Jim, I'm sorry, James Duffin, Jim Duffin. So Jim is the interim um acting university archivist at the University of Pennsylvania. And we are excited to hear that you are actually digitizing some of the archival work. And so would you talk a little bit about why you're digitizing that and what that will mean for um, both ease of Nina working on the biography and what it also means for um, the next generation to learn about Dr. Alexander. Thanks, good afternoon. First, I must uh, congratulate Dr. Banks on her great achievement here with this book and also thank her for all the incredible work she's been doing on Sadie Alexander. Um, I, I can just add a personal anecdote. We've often at the University Archives staff had lots of researchers come and use the papers and most of them have used Raymond's papers um, but, and we've often asked, you know, well, who's gonna do a biography of Sadie? I mean, we have this whole other section of the collection. And so we're really pleased with uh, Dr. Banks's work. Um, I consider it a great honor to be able to speak here today after the Alexander family. If it wasn't for their foresight and beneficence, we would not be able to have the rich program discussion today. The donation of their family papers to the Penn University Archives and Record Center is, I would dare say, one of the most significant personal papers gifts to our archives. Mm -hmm. One of the key roles that archives serve in our culture is the preservation of memory. It is a point I really don't need to convince you attending here today. The challenge many archives have been coming to terms with in recent years is whose memory is saved. All too often archives are a mirror of the dominant culture and its definitions of memory, which frequently left out marginalized groups. Fortunately, thanks to the generosity of the Alexander families and Dr. Banks' works, we are able to broaden our public memory. Preservation, however, is not only the role, not the only role of archives. Access in many ways is perhaps the critical role an archive serves for society because without access to the memory, without access to the memory, the memory is effectively dead. We are fortunate that we live in an age now where thanks to the internet and scanning technology, access can be broad not only in terms of audience, but also media. Some of the recent work we have done digitizing the Alexander families has actually made parts of the collection that were previously inaccessible, not only accessible, but accessible to a wider audience. One of the challenges for most archives is how to provide access to motion pictures, videos, or sound recordings. Both of these are in the collection and, and did not, we did not have the right access to provide easy at, um, uh, viewing of these materials. Several years ago, we started digitizing some of these materials and now they are available uh, to a wider audience. Um, one of the examples of, of things that we've digitized are some audio recordings. And that actually was um, prompted by a fairly recent donation by the Alexander family. It's great that they keep giving us more material. 
and we were sent a reel-to-reel -reel audio tape and I was looking at it and saying, well, it'd be nice to know what's on this. So I also thought, well, let's see all the other audio tapes we have in the collections. So we sent them off to be digitized and we brought them back and we were really surprised to discover that in one of the audio tapes we had was an interview that included both Saman and Rady, Saman and Raymond talking about their early legal careers and the challenges they had studying and practicing law in Philadelphia from the 1920s to the 1950s. And so thanks to this digital technology, this material is now available. And we've also posted it to our YouTube account. So it's available to the entire world. And we've also scanned, another thing we scanned recently was Sadie's scrapbook from the time she was a student at the university. And one of the great things about being able to do that is scrapbooks tend to be very fragile to handle. A lot of things are kind of clipped in and then they had to be unfolded. And so by scanning this material and completely unfolding things and, and scanning them in sequence, we are now able to provide full access to the scrapbook. So this is a wonderful scrapbook she has documenting her time as a student and all the press coverage and photographs of, of her time. And then the last thing we've been digitizing also are some of the family films, which are an incredible record of the life that the Alexander family lived and also the world they interacted with. One of the earliest films we have is their visit to Paris in 1930. And that was, some of that footage was actually used recently in a documentary on um, African-American artists who moved to Paris at that time. So it, it's, it's wonderful that we're now able to start broadening this um, access to materials and, and exposing the, the, expanding the public memory of the Alexander family and their contributions to our society and culture. Well, well thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to, to hear that and we'll be going to YouTube to actually hear and to look at more of what you have. So, so thank you for making that more accessible to the public and more importantly to the broader economics profession and to Nina, congratulations. This is a fabulous day, super excited for you. Um, and Willie, I'm um, turning it back over to you. Thank you very much, Rhonda. I would like to introduce Professor David Card, who is the president of the American Economics Association. Um, I once worked in foreign exchange and we always said that timing is everything. I, I think it's almost uncanny that all of these uh, dates have come together, but also that all these people have come together in a special way. Both the president of IAFI now and Professor Card are experts in the area of labor economics and understand very much uh, the role that the labor markets have played in the persistence of inequality in American economic life. And so I'd like to ask uh, Professor Clark, if the work of Sadie Alexander helps to inform our understanding of the American labor markets and inequality in the 20th century. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm really uh, very glad to be here. Um, thanks for that nice introduction. Congratulations, Nina, for uh, this day. Uh, this is a, a great occasion. And um, I, on behalf of um, all the uh, people who are looking forward to reading this, I, I think this is a great launch. Uh, it's also very inspiring for me to hear um, from Sadie Alexander's family members and um, to sort of be able to see the the kind of intergenerational links that economists are really interested in and uh, starting to understand are so important in in um, t today's economy and in action, uh, seeing that in front of us. And also to learn about the archives. Fascinating that there's a film as well as a documentary uh, materials. Uh, I'm also grateful to um, Julianne Malveaux for uh, bringing up the memory of Phyllis Wallace. Um, she was an extremely important um, person in the field of labor economics, one of the first to really um, make the central role of studying 
uh, discrimination and uh, issues like that. And um, I only met her one time myself, but she was extremely uh, influential to my thesis advisor, Orly Eschenfelter, and Orly always spoke extremely highly of, of Phyllis. And um, she was certainly um, one of the most important um, people of her generation in, in trying to get labor economics as a field focused on the issues of facing African-Americans uh, in particular. Uh, in terms of the legacy of the work, um, I think that importantly nowadays, I think economists and especially labor economists have come to understand much better uh, that everything we see around us isn't just a choice. Uh, the sort of paradigm or simplest way to think about it, what's wrong with economics is we, we tend to say, well, people chose this, they chose that, and we love to study that, that aspect of behavior. But her work, I think, and her life really shows the importance of understanding the constraints and issues. Um, the, and we're starting to see, I think, in, in my field, a much better understanding of the um, pervasive role of things like systematic racism in limiting opportunities, not just um, at one stage of a career, but all through a career. And we're really seeing um, a much better appreciation now that the longer term data is available. We can see individuals through their careers, choices that are being made and constraints that are impeding those, those choices and gradually leading to differences in outcomes. And I think that her, um, her work really emphasized that and her life also emphasizes that. And I think hopefully that, that will um, become a bigger and bigger part of, of um, economic research in the future. Thank you very much. I'd now like to ask Lily Shorney to speak to us about her work as the research assistant who actually was in the archives. And Lily, um, I can't tell you how many times Professor Banks has said that your role was absolutely critical in this book. While you probably read many, many speeches, was there one that stands out in your mind as important for you and your understanding of uh, the work of, of Dr. Alexander? Yes, thank you so much. I'm so excited and honored to be here today and to be a part of such an important moment and event. And um, yes, I would say that as I did read through a lot of different speeches and transcribe a lot of um, a lot of them, I really enjoyed all of them and I found them all to be very meaningful. But the speech that I would say was the most meaningful to me um, is titled Negro Women in Our Economic Life, which is included in the second part of the book um, focused on black women in the political, econ political economy. And mm -hmm. This speech was really meaningful to me because um, Alexander incorporates an intersectional uh, approach that explores the impact of market production on women's household work and the unique experiences of Black women specifically in comparison to men and white women. And I find this speech to be incredibly powerful because it addresses and acknowledges the unpaid labor of women in addition to the paid labor of Black women, which has often been um, excluded from the narrative. And in my women's and gender studies uh, major courses, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and having conversations about this topic and the importance of intersectionality in general. And it's really amazing to read um, about Alexander's insights on this um, important issue that's still so prevalent in today's world in um, current times and to see that you know, she was writing about these things and thinking about them in the 1920s and 30s. And um, in the way that history, or I guess mainstream history, has neglected to include her important insights is uh, an injustice to us all and a disadvantage for us all, as has been mentioned previously. And um, this also gave me a new perspective on my majors in general, as I am a psychology and women's and gender studies double major. So um, this was sort of um, an introduction for me into um, economics topics and concepts that I am not studying in other areas of my education, um, which has totally influenced my perspective on my other majors. And um, 
This work is so important and I'm so proud and grateful to have had the opportunity to be a part of the creation of this book. Um, it's such an honor to be here, as I said before, and I cannot thank Dr. Banks enough for her deeply influential mentorship and support over the past three years. This is a really special moment. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn to our last speaker, and certainly this is um, a special honor to ask Bernard Anderson to speak. Dr. Anderson is a native Philadelphian who actually knew the Alexander family. Uh, perhaps most important for us today is that Bernard Anderson followed in Dr. Alexander's footsteps, and he was the seventh African-American to earn the PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. He earned that degree in, in 1969, and at the same time, he was one of the founders of the National Economics Association. Professor Anderson was the first African-American to receive tenure at the Wharton School. And he is now the Whitney Young Jr. Professor Emeritus. Professor Anderson, I'd like to ask what contribution uh, the work of Sadie Alexander makes to our understanding of the economic conditions of African-Americans in the United States. And also, I hope you'll share with us your view of the contribution that Professor Nina Banks has made by writing this book. What now has she contributed to the history of economic thought? Well, thank you very much, uh, Willeen, for that wonderful introduction and I, thank uh, Nina Banks for inviting me to say a few words during the uh, launch of this very important book. Uh, now, you gave me a time limit. I'm an old university professor program for 50 minutes. Uh, and anything less than that is cruel and unusual punishment. But I have written out a few words that I hope will keep me to the time limit that you have given me. Let me say that I met Sadie Alexander when I was a teenager. Uh, she and her husband, Raymond Pace Alexander, organized and led the Cotillion, which was a, an annual event to introduce youth to society. Uh, Mary and Ray will perhaps remembered the cotillion that was held at Philadelphia's Convention Hall. Uh, I'll say that Sadie and Raymond Pace Alexander stood at the pinnacle of social class in the black community. I, I knew Sadie Alexander as a prominent, highly respected lawyer. I learned much later in life that she earned a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. And in fact, I learned that from my friend of long standing, Julianne Malvo. Uh, we owe Nina Banks a deep debt of gratitude for the Herculean task she performed in recovering the economic thoughts and writings of Sadie Alexander, uh, putting them in the storehouse of knowledge on race and economics where they belong. Uh, Sadie Alexander documented, analyzed, and explained the broad, deep, persistent racial economic disparities that engulf African Americans, denying them the opportunity to achieve economic security and to build wealth. She was not recognized as an economist, Despite her academic preparation in the profession, and as you know, uh, she was a victim of the racial and gender discrimination she wrote about. In my view, however, she made a significant institutional econ uh, contribution to e institutional economic 
analysis in her explanation of the employment and income status of black workers. And early on, she skillfully designed and conducted population surveys in order to do the analysis. And later she plumbed the depths of BLS uh, data sets, which until the 1960s had few labor series classified by race. Today, much is said and efforts are being made by the American Economic Association, the Federal Reserve, and some predominantly white higher education institutions to break down uh, racial and gender barriers to equal opportunity. I'll add, however, that these efforts have long been recommended and pushed by the National Economic Association, the co-host of this webinar. Uh, Sadie Alexander's writings to a great extent set the baseline for the challenge that must be overcome. She followed the dictates of the prophet Isaiah, who urged the soldiers of Zion to strengthen their stakes and lengthen their cords to gain the victory. And this book should be required reading, in my view, for every student who takes a course in Economics 101. And perhaps that will hasten the day when the practice of the economics profession will match the promise of the economics profession. So thank you for allowing me to share those thoughts on this very important day in the launch of this book. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. And I would like to bring this discussion to a close with just um, my own brief comment about the work of Sadie Alexander. I also have studied labor economics and I, and. Before I was an economist, I actually did graduate work in history. But I must say that the speeches that I've read, and I've only read a few, but they provide a level of detail about the labor markets at that time that has been missing from anything else that I've ever read. Her uh, the ability of Sadie Alexander to identify not only in the types of industries that women were working, that Black women were working, but to very carefully help us to understand the severe limitations that they faced and the fact that they were only able to work in perhaps one or two jobs and that in many factories their only position open to Black women was that of cleaning the factories. So we have a new understanding of the markets, labor markets, both by her experience, by the limitations that she faced, whereas the other women who had obtained doctorates were able to teach at the M Street School, the secondary school in Washington, uh, when Sadie Alexander returned to Philadelphia or what when she sought work in Philadelphia, she faced the restriction that black women were only able to teach in elementary schools, not in high schools. Those two women with doctorates who taught at the M Street School found themselves as faculty of Howard just a few years later that stepping stone was not available to Sadie Alexander. And it's opened our eyes to the existence of truly onerous weight of economic oppression that was faced in what, what many of us thought was a very liberal city of the American North. So thank you, Nina, for introducing us to Sadie. And I'd like to close the webinar with 
your voice reading for us from one of Sadie's speeches. And uh, again, many thanks to all who have participated, both as attendees, but as panelists. And I think everyone has commented that the presence of the family here has added a special level of our understanding of the contribution that Sadie Alexander has made to the, our understanding of life in America in the 20th century. Thank you, Professor Banks, please. Thank you, Willene. And I actually have nine minutes and I have three, three pieces that I'd like to read. Um, but Virginia sent me a note in the chat uh, and asked me to mention her grandmother's Baroque handwriting. And what I can say about that handwriting is that it was practically indecipherable. Um, and I've talked about this elsewhere, but I had to use a magnifying glass to try to figure out and I had to develop my own little key. I don't know what Lily did, but that's what I had to do. And there were some words that I was never able to um, figure out that Lily and I couldn't figure out. So uh, this was very much a, a labor of love. Um, and then the other thing that I want to point out before I read the speeches is that Sadie Alexander focused on African African American men and women. Um, you know, so I think there's this sense that she focused that she pri prioritized Black women or African American women. She did not. She focused um, a great deal of attention on both African American men and women. So three speeches um, that I think. Um, illustrate the breadth of her thinking um, and also um, speeches um, that uh, or selections that really deal with some of the topics that we are talking about today. So Willeen, you mentioned that it's rich in data. The first um, paragraph that I want to read is from a 1936 address on Negro achievement. And I've chosen this one because it deals with black farmers and we're talking about black farmers quite a bit today. The Negro has undoubtedly contributed more labor in proportion to his numbers to American civilization than any other of the many racial groups that constitute this heterogeneous population. It is difficult to measure his contribution in this field because records are not made of the Negroes who build roads, subways, railroads, and factories. In the field of agriculture, however, we have a definite record of his contribution. In 1929, there was produced on farms operated by colored men and women, 32.4% of all the cotton produced in the United States, 24.9% of all the sweet potatoes produced in the United States, 18.9% of all the tobacco produced in the United States, 16.4% of the total corn harvested for grain in the United States, and 10.1% of the Irish potatoes harvested in the United States. Yet Negro farm operators constituted only 14% of all farm operators, while the Negro population represented only 9.7% of all the total population. And this 9.7% of the American population produced almost one third of the staples required for American life. This is unheralded achievement. Second selection is from my favorite speech um, that she gave in 1939, Coming Events Cast Their Shadow. And the, the, um, the video that Wes Bernstein and I created had um, um, a song by Marian Anderson in that. And I chose that because the discriminatory treatment that she received from the daughters of the American Revolution was one of the factors that motivated her to write this um, amazing speech. There is considerable difference of opinion among leaders of Negro thought regarding the third point in a program to preserve our democratic institutions in this period of stress. There are those among us who think that at such a time we should lessen pressure for a fuller share of the rights legally ours 
for fear that so doing we may arouse even greater racial hatred. Opposed to this line of thought is the steady and relentless effort being made by the NAACP to open state-supported institutions of higher learning to Negro students or to provide for them an education equal to that provided white students. In my opinion, the NAACP is pursuing the only proper course. To begin with, we must be ever vigilant and watchful of our rights. Postponing action on a demand for fundamental rights will only result in the loss of greater rights. If we become inarticulate and inactive in pressing for the full benefits of a democratic government, it will be taken for granted that not only do no greater rights have to be given to us, but the meager benefits of a democracy that we now enjoy can be taken from us. There must be no compromise with reaction. All right, and then the final selection comes from my probably second favorite speech because I'm thinking about this one a lot lately, 1942. And this is a speech called on the status of the Philadelphia Negro. Equally reprehensible is our failure to protect the Negro masses from the deprivation of their liberty without due process of law. Who in Philadelphia does not hang his head in shame when he recalls the mass arrest in 1941 in Northern Philadelphia of over 200 Negroes without warrants or probable cause who were held in jail for 24 to 48 hours. Every colored person in this neighborhood, on the streets, in a store, about to enter his home was arrested on the basis that because of frequent pocketbook snatching, attacks and assaults, it was necessary to round up every colored man or woman on these streets. Coincidentally, if not particularly significant, is the fact that a political campaign had just closed in which the people of this neighborhood had dared assert their political freedom. The reason why I think that uh, selection is really interesting is because it connects events, policing events that were taking place in 1942 with an earlier era of um, white lynch mobs that used um, acts of terror to suppress black political agency. And so in 1942, Sadie Alexander was making that same point about policing and that the police had taken on the role of, of, of harassing um, and arresting African-Americans as a form of political suppression. And I think that we can also think about that in the context of more recent policies such as broken windows um, and stop and frisk um, as not just policies which and, and behaviors that criminalize African-Americans, but we can think about that now also in the context of these ongoing attempts to suppress African-American political agency. So I'm going to stop there and thank all of you for your wonderful participation in this event to commemorate the, the centennial anniversary of Sadie Alexander's doctorate and the restoration of her economic thought, her intellectual thought to our discipline and to the nation more generally. Thank you all very much for, for being a part of this amazing event.